We ought to actually. I'll just use it into the presentation if somebody says something. <laughs> no, I need that open. Russ. 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 Test also. I find I have to hook this up first and then plug it in. I don't know why in my computer do I need. A what? Yeah, Sophie's looking at that. This one here. Yeah. Thank you. Do you need it to stay on, brother? Can I, you need that to stay on for a while? Yeah. Yeah? You can just turn the first slide on and put it okay. Oh, oh, can I, okay. Just put a blank slide. Oh, blank slide, yeah. Just yeah. Oh, I wanted to do something while I was doing this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. After when, yeah, no, I agree. I hear you. No, we won't. I'm going to just go with it. Oh yeah, it loves to do that. And there's a man who don't like righteousness who loves to do yes. that. Yes. 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 
Раз, раз, раз. Раз, раз, раз. Раз, раз. Раз, раз. Раз. You know how, right? You move this electric to the other side. Okay.
Not sure if I'm going to remember all these things. Let's see, I think. <laughs> Testing. Testing. Testing, testing. <laughs> testing, testing. <coughs> okay, I think we're good to start. I'm going to just start with a word of prayer and then we will begin, okay? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings today, Lord, and your Sabbath day. We thank you for nature. We thank you for the sun. And we thank you so much, Lord, for your son whom you've sent to die for us. Thank you for the lessons this morning. We ask now that as we um, speak on this topic of the brain, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your wisdom, for we know that uh, you have all wisdom above. We ask that you just share that with us, Lord, that we may gain that and use it to honor you and to be blessed people. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not going to start like normal, um, how you may typically think. Uh, I want to just tell you about a story, actually, of three individuals. There were three ladies, pretty much in their 60s. No offense of anybody in the 60s with this story. This isn't you. So there are some ladies up in their 60s, and they're, they're talking with each other. And a one lady was just mentioning some of the struggles with the brain. She was saying something like, oh, I just... You know, I'm just finding myself forgetting certain things. I go to the bottom of the stairs and I can't remember, was I going up or was I coming down? And then the other lady says, I know what you mean. I mean, I don't have that specific one. But the other day I opened the fridge and I don't remember what I was going for. And then the, the third lady, praising the Lord, says, thank God I don't have those problems. Knock on wood. And then she says, oh, that must be the door. Let me go get it. <laughs> Now, this is, <laughs> you know, we, we, we laugh at that, right, because it's funny. But this is some of the struggles that people are facing mentally, right? And then we, we look upon others and we think, oh, well, good thing I don't have that type of brain. Um, and the beautiful thing is we're going to learn today your brain is unique. Your brain is so beautiful. No, you bet nobody ever told you that compliment, huh, ladies? You have such a beautiful brain. Wow. If nobody told you, God is telling you you have a beautiful brain. And that's what I just want from you. I just want you to be happy about your brain. I want you to have happy thoughts about what your brain can do. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, um, this man, Michu Aikon, he's Korean, I think he is, um, a neurophysicist and all, and all the other things and letters and the alphabets that comes after a name. It says, believe it or not, sitting on our shoulders is the most, what, complex object that Mother Nature has created in the known, what, now, remember that word universe. We're going to come back to it. So he says, in all the universe, I've seen nothing like what weighs upon your head. But even with that thing that weighs upon your head, even in the past, there's been these, you know, these different belief systems. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about the story with these ladies, and, and that could be funny. But what's not funny is that this has been a thought process that basically, at a, a, from a child in the brain development, as the brain develops, it has this, what we're going to term today in our topic, neuroplasticity. This ability of the brain to adapt to change according to circumstances and whatnot. Now, we'll get more into that definition. Now, when this came on the scene, neuroplasticity, um, it was kind of laughed at, is, if you would, right? So plasticity was first by a man, uh, was coined plasticity or, or said that way in the 1890s, 1890s specifically, where William James um, used this definition in his, in his book, Principles of uh, Psychology, and he was saying that the brain actually is not fixed into adulthood. And you remember, this was the leading thought at the time, that as you grow up into adult, I'm just, my brain is going to grow older, I'm going to start to degrade, and I'm going to go downhill, the plane will crash, it is what it is. Isn't that a sad thought that that is reality? Notice that's not reality, but if you think that's reality and you live in that reality, you'll be living in a false reality as we're going to learn today. Now, um, because of that, even up to the 1890, they've been what I'm going to coin. I don't know if this has ever been in psychology or psychologists not going to like me for this term, but I love this term. I'm just going to name it a neurocobweb. 
A neurocobweb belief, basically, in this idea, these principles, that you, you, the, the brain has been so fixed that it's no longer malleable, it's harder for you to learn. And those who have been a little older, maybe you felt that way. Oh, it's just hard for me to learn. I'm old, so I'm not going to learn like the young people. And what you've done is you have been training your mind in the very thing they say don't exist. Isn't that interesting? This was common now up to the 1970s. So about 1970 is actually where the ideas start to come that maybe the brain can actually think more than we thought it can think. Isn't that interesting? And if you think about it, 1970 is not that far away. Now, some of us who were born in the 1980s, we think, oh, that's right there. Now, those who were born in the 2000s, my daughter always tell me, Daddy, you're old. <laughs> and she says, was things in black and white when you were around? <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you my response. Um, in other words, so, you know, so, th so basically this thought process that you, you can't change, it, it has that same adaptation, the same thing that you could probably finish. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. New tricks. Or can you? Now you, you decide, right? What do you want to do? What do you believe when you hear these kind of things? Now, <clears throat> there is this, this, this book called Discovering the Brain, and I'm going to just read this to you. The making of the human brain from the tip of a three milliliter long neural tube. This is a neural tube, by the way. You, you've seen pictures of fetuses, correct? The fetus of a child. So that's before that, right? So this part right here is called the neural tube. And so what he's saying is at the very tip, at this point, right? Oh, wrong one. Uh, from the very tip, which is only 0.18 um, inches, as you can see, long neural tube is a marvel of what? Biological engineering. When you hear engineering, what do you think? A mind, wisdom. And yet he's an atheist. I can't comprehend things like this. To arrive at the more than how many? 86 billion neurons that are the normal complement of a newborn baby. The brain must grow at a rate of how much a, mi how much a minute? 250,000 neurons, how often? Every minute. That means my wife, Tarina Hewlett, she's sitting in the back, when she, while she's pregnant, from the day of conception, right, that brain needs to form, and it must form to keep up with the calculations of God, beautiful Matt, it must form 250,000 neurons every minute. So every minute Tarina's walking around, as tired as she is, an amazing process is going on in her body that only can come from above. Amen. And they see it, and you're gonna, I'm going to show you in different fields how people are excited about this. Uh, on average, throughout the course of the pregnancy, so this is the, the neural um, tube, which interestingly enough, you know, when the neural tube closes some of that amniotic fluid in the, in the, in the um, womb there, it, the baby actually, some of that actually closes in with it, so that cerebral fluid, actually, it actually becomes, that amniotic fluid becomes the cerebral fluid for that child. Isn't that interesting? All right? So notice this. Now we have, these are the three parts of the brain that we're going to get into, right? The cerebrum, cerebellum, right there on the bottom. The brain stem, uh, right there is also the medulla, anybody, medulla oblongata? You've heard that term before? A very interesting, weird term. Um, so this is where the hypothalamus and thalamus is, and this one, we're not going to talk about the diencephalon today, so don't, don't worry about that, act like you've never seen it. Now, when it comes to the brain, remember I told you, your brain is beautiful, and we're talking about if you're about 150 pounds on average, then your brain is going to be about 2% of your body weight at 3 pounds. Now, that 3-pound structure is taking almost a quarter amount of your blood supply, almost a quarter, not almost, a quarter amount of your glucose, and it's driving everything that's you. So this little three pounds walking up here, as you walk and you move your feet, it's controlling so much. How are we treating that which is controlling everything? And we learned earlier that it's 60% of fat. The other 40% is like water and proteins and other. You ever see that in, in one of your signings, other? Yep, that's a good way. If you don't know what it is, just say other. No, but I do know. It's water, proteins, and salt specifically. Um, but neuroplasticity. This is where we get into what you can become through this object, through this thought of neuroplasticity, and this blows my mind. You and I, when we hear this word, anybody ever heard neuroplasticity before? Yep, okay. Um, so basically, at the end of this presentation, nobody's brain in here will be the same. 
Structurally, nobody's brain in this room is going to be the same when you leave this room. This is why when you go into a sermon and you say, oh, I've heard it before, your brain wouldn't be the same if you heard that sermon. But because we choose, if a man choose not to hear the word of God, guess what he did? His brain remains not the same. And I'm going to show you why. Neuroplasticity. Even rejection makes changes. Yeah. All right? I know this thing is sweet. I, we'll get into it. So the brain's ability to change and adapt to experience and circumstances is neuroplasticity. Its ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections throughout life. And I love that last part, throughout life, because remember before, it was thought it was going to be degrading as you age. And while there is age-related degradation, I'm not saying there's not, it, we have to be careful of bringing on a time of trouble before the time of trouble, right? right? Okay, so I just have four simple goals. One, to educate you on the brain plasticity. Two, to give you tools to facilitate better neuroplasticity. The third goal is to attempt to beat the statistics that about 70% of what you're going to learn in a day, you're going to forget. And then to inform you that God's signature is written on every neuron in your, in your brain. Now, when you think about you on planet Earth, there is this, 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 okay. Isaiah 45, verse 18. I don't know why that did that. So Isaiah 45, 18, he says that I am the God. I made the heavens and the earth, right? And when he talked about his creation, he says that I did not make it in vain. I made it to be inhabited. Which means that when he created, he created with intent. So now that you are on the earth, there is an intention of God for your brain. And if, you're, if your brain has an intent, that means you have a purpose, so what's your purpose? Now, before we talk about your purpose, this is how I'm going to show you how beautiful your brain is. Now, imagine, you know, this is going to sound like the beginning of a bad joke, but a, neuro, a, a neurosurgeon and an astrophysicist got together in a room. And they decided, let's study the brain. And the other said, well, let's study the universe. So guess what they did? They studied both together. You want to know what they came up with? It's, it's an unusual, this is what they said themselves. An unusual study was itself carried out by Italian specialists in two very different fields. Astrophysicist Franco Vaza and from the University of Bolo Bologna, I'm guessing, and neurosurgeon Alberto Felitti from the University of Verona. The tantalizing degree of similarity that our analysis exposes seems to suggest that the self-organization of both complex systems, studying the brain and the universe, is likely being shaped by similar principles of network dynamics despite the radically different scales and processes at play. As they study them, they said there's something that is very similar between what we're seeing in the universe and what we're seeing in your brain. I wonder what it is. One of the most compelling insights of the study involved looking at the brain's neuro neuronal network as a universe in itself. This network contains about 69, but really they come to say 86, billion neurons. If you're keeping score, the observable universe has a web of at least how many? 100 billion galaxies. Another similarity is the defined nature of their network neurons and galaxies, that they have nodes connected by filaments. By studying the average number of connections in each node and the clustering of the connections in nodes, the researchers concluded that there were definite agreement levels in connectivity, suggesting the two networks grew as a result of similar physical principles. So when God was creating the universe, guess what he was saying? I can't make to make that small universe within your brain. There were similarities that, that they're seeing in the physical creation of these. They say there's something here that even if we didn't know, there's a connection. And sometimes you may feel like, oh, God is just above. But he's trying to show you, you know, the things I've created above, I want to show you I'm just as there in your mind, if you will let me be. And this is, so this is a neuron, right? So this is how a neuron looks. This is the dendrites. And uh, what does a dendrite look like? A tree. I didn't, did I put that in your mind? Did I tell you to do a tree? No, I might have do some advertising if you saw the tree here. No, I might, some, 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 what do you call that? Um, subliminal. subliminal messages to you. But it looks like a tree. But I brought that because I thought it looked like a tree also. And Ellen White says, um, in um, Mind, Character, and Personality, she says the, the similarities between an uncultivated feel and an uncultivated mind is striking. 
If I go to a field, Proverbs says the same thing, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. He went to the field of one that slept and it was overtaken. If we sleep on our understanding of what the brain's ability is, you will be overtaken. But this is how, this is just a, a simple, we won't get into all of it, you know, all of the whole, um, this, we'll go into the basics basically. So this is the whole thing here is called a soma, which is the body of the, the cell or the, the, the nucleus, the central part of the neuron. And then you have these dendrites, which I want to pay special attention to as we move on. And then you have this tail, which is an axon. And then you have these little sheaths called a myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath, if you put a, a, a neuron, two neurons together, and you see one without a myelin sheath and one with a, with a sheath, um, and the electrical impulse, which is a stimulation of the mind, that's a thought or something, the electrical impulse that goes down, because of the sheath wrapping over the axon, it'll actually move quicker. And I love this because that means that if somebody was going to say, oh, natural selection or something happened, can you imagine some slow human beings just walking around? And we're not talking about a little slower. Huge difference. Now, th at the end of this right here is the terminal part. So basically, as the, uh, you have these dendrites that starts to kind of spread out, and this is going to become important as we continue, right? Uh, it, 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 it reminds me of this. This is how it's going to look. And we're going to get into that. And the reason why I bring these things up, we're told in Christ's Object Lessons that there's a key that unlocks scripture. Anybody know what that key is? Nature is a key that unlocks scripture. So if I want to understand more about God's word or God's voice, we've been hearing about the importance of the word of God, then what's another avenue or, or study I should do? Nature. Now, there's two ways in which, the, three, but we won't go into the functional one. We'll just talk about two today. Two ways specifically in which we learn. And the first one is chemical, and you can see this right here, right? So as a signal, as you have a stimulating thought, so think a thought a second. Okay, you just did. Now, when you think that thought, electrical impulses goes down through the myelin sheath, and it hits at the end of this, which is a synapse, which is just the space in between two neurons, and then it hit the, that electrical impulse starts these vessels, which holds neurotransmitters. So within that is these little vessels, a circle. Within the circle are little neurotransmitters. When the electrical pulse, with enough electrical pulse, se um, hits that, it sends out the neurotransmitters, of which we'll get into the different ones. Um, so this is the chemical way. So basically, when I'm learning, one way of learning is through the chemical process, chemical um, synapses, right? And a neurotransmitter, some of those are acetylcholine, and you may have heard of some of these also, um, gamma, gamma amino butyric acid, glutamate, which is an amino acid, dopamine, and serotonin. Now, all of these play an important role in learning, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that. So what's, and the other one is a structural. Now, something happened to my slides, so just, I'll, we'll move on from there, okay? But the second one is also structural. So, um, you know, you just have, and this is where, I'll just move on to this to show you, structural is when the dendrites themselves begin to grow. So, for instance, in nature, you would see a tree, right? And, and wintertime, how does that tree look? It looks bare. But as spring comes, what begins to happen? It starts to bud. So things start to branch out more. Does that make sense? And the same thing is happening in your mind. So, but the question we have to ask ourselves are, what makes things, this is going to be so interesting on the TV as people just seeing me with this in my hand, what makes things branch out more? Because that's going to create stronger connections. So that's what we're going to look at. Hopefully, my, my, my slides are here. Um, yeah, there. So a couple of them are mi missing, so we're going to just kind of roll with it. Um, so we're going to look at some things that facilitate neuroplasticity. I don't know what happened to my slides, but we don't need it. This is why you have backup. Praise the Lord. So when you, so when you have neuroplasticity, your brain, as you go, neuroplasticity, the ability to learn, I'm going to show you an example of it. Um, uh, Nathan, can you come here a second, buddy? So in my bag, I have something that Nathan is going to get. Nathan, do you know what's in here? No. You don't know. Anybody know what's in this bag? Air. Is anybody, what would you say? Air. Air, that's one thing. <laughs> does, anybody ha does anybody start thinking when they saw this bag, I wonder what's in the bag? Yeah. Who put, put up your hand if you saw that? Nathan, can you do me a favor? Can you just reach in? Don't look. I want you just to touch what's in that bag. 
Just touch it. What does it feel like? Tell the individ tell the people. Soft. Soft. What else? Sounds like a hard. Mm-hmm. Okay, you can take one. Take one out. What is that? That's a piece of the brain. You ever give somebody a piece of your mind? That's not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing. So we need all that we can have, right? So this is a part of the brain. Thank you, brother. Can you put that back in the bag for me, please? Thank you. You can go sit down. Nathan, can you come back up here, please? Can you take something from out here, please? What is that? The piece of the brain. OK. Have you ever give somebody a piece of your mind? Oh, thank you. Nathan, can you put that back in for me, please? You can go sit down. Nathan, can you come here a second, please? <laughs> no, 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 you can go sit down, my brother. Now, why did I do that? Now, there's something in the brain that happens when something new happens. You begin to release dopamine, and that dopamine we know as a reward neurotransmitter, reward um, feeling, right? So dopamine is released when you're, you're learning. Why do you think that's important? It makes learning fun. That tells me I was made to learn and to have fun learning. I wasn't made to just have a boring learning experience, which tells me something about God. God is what? He's fun. You know, we don't like to say that. We kind of feel like, no, we can't say that about God. God is fun. The Bible says God sings. The Bible says God's laugh. Why can't he be fun? So when God, when God is creating, what just happened now, there's these encoding structures that now is going to happen. Nathan tonight, as Nathan just pulled that out and he had this new experience, the wonder of everybody in this room of what was in that bag was a new stimuli. And whether you remember or forget is up to two things. How novel that was for you, for how much dopamine was released. And the second thing that I'm going to get into which leads us to another point of facilitating learning. When you're learning something, have fun. You've been, you come to these seminars. I don't know how many people have been to these seminars for a long time. When you come to these seminars, as you're learning, find fun ways to learn it. Because if you do that, you're actually going to remember it. And if you remember it, that's a big part of the battle for doing it. So what we want to do is create a, a mindset, a capacity in our mind that allows us to continue to remember and not just remember because what happened in, in, in Nathan brain, why I did it twice is because I actually want Nathan to think about it. I want Nathan to think about the brain for the day. That when Nathan is going past me, he says, hey brain, I mean Jai. <laughs> and what begins to happen in Nathan's brain as he does this and Nathan is thinking about, oh, I had such a good experience today. I remember when I put my hand in there and it was this squishy, weird feeling thing. Nathan is going to think about that experience and it, and it could actually last Nathan's lifetime. And you know there's individuals, individuals that have experiences and shouldn't we make such a mark as Christians in people's lives that it lasts them a lifetime? That they can look back and say, oh, I remember when I met this person. And you know the way you do that? One of the ways when you're teaching, when you're, when you're teaching somebody something, make it fun. Make it interesting for them. And don't make it interesting for you. Make it interesting for them. So facilitating learning, novelty. The, number sec the second one is sleep. Mm, praise the Lord. That tells me a lot when you just say, mm, we have to talk about sleep. So, um, so basically with sleep, Okay, it would have been sleep right there. Basically with sleep, now that we've all learned these things, some of you, as you know, from listening to all these health laws, we just had lunch not too long ago. What's happening with the blood? Uh, you have a fixed amount of blood in the body, so a lot, some of that is just what? Going to the stomach. You know, there's some wise people who know how to, if they're going, they just kind of stretch, they kind of move. You know, you do those. I'm famous for that. If you see me moving, that's what I'm doing. But what begins to happen too is um, not just that. As you go throughout the day, the things you've learned, it's up to you on how much of that thing you remember. 
Now, when you go to bed in the night, so today you hear this, you are, you're like, man, this was a, a wonderful presentation. Oh, pharmacology and sanctification, that was a wonderful presentation. And then supper comes, you listen to Dwayne Lemon, oh, that was a wonderful pr presentation. And then nighttime comes, you usually go to bed at 9 o'clock, but for some reason that night, 10.30 rolls around, oh, it is late, I'm supposed to be in bed. So what you do at that time, you decide, let me go to bed. But what just happened is, if you were normally used to going to bed at 9, when you went to bed at 10.30, your hippocampus, you, everything in your body runs on a clock. Did you know that? So you have things that goes on during sleep, things like growth hormone. Growth hormones is released throughout the day, really. But you have the biggest bolus of growth hormone, especially that first cycle of sleep. So if you miss the first cycle of sleep, you've actually missed the big bolus of that growth hormone. But not just that. Look at this. Research can't explain memories drift from what? Neuron to neuron. So basically from the hippocampus, when you sleep, you ever had a dream of something that happened that day? So your body, your mind I should say, was using the, the day's event and consolidating and finding out what's important and what's not. So the body and the hippocampus, if this is important enough for you, if this is something that you're stressing, if this is something that you, you're interested in, your uh, a memory, depending on how strong that memory was, it moves from the hippocampus, and they found that they could actually, um, what's that word? Seek or trace, that's the word, trace the memory from neuron to neuron. And the memory goes from the hippocampus, and it starts to move up into the cortex, but later in the cycles of sleep. So if I miss the first cycle of sleep, it's not just that it happens later, you miss that possibility. So it doesn't go as deep in the brain as it would have went if you have gotten that sleep. And then we say, oh man, what, what did he talk about? Something with the brain? Well, yeah, <laughs> but something with the brain. So the be one of the best ways to facilitate neuroplasticity, the learning you've learned, is actually to go to sleep on time. This is why they did studies on, on people with um, <coughs> in college students. And I don't know, anybody was a crammer? We have any crammers? So yeah, if you're a crammer, when, you, when you, you know, you're cramming all these things, it, it, and then you go to sleep, it actually doesn't go from the hippocampus deeper into the cortex. Now it travels, it goes from neuron to neuron, but it actually doesn't go as deep. And if it doesn't go as deep, then what you may have is some strong chemical synapsis, but what you missed was what the Lord is trying to do to every tree. Now, every tree that you see here, imagine that your life was dependent upon your garden. How would you feel if this was your last tree? And your last tree, your, whatever grows on this tree, is whatever you're going to live on. And then here I come. This thing is tough, by the way, because it's spring, <laughs> right? And we'll get into that too. So I just took, what just happened? Your dendrites, remember we say the dendrites are those ones that reach out, right? So I just removed some of those dendrites. Guess, what, guess what's a factor in removing de dendrites? When you don't continue to use, you know the use it or lose it? Yeah. This is true in the brain. So you have the potential. Now, the brain is something that it seems like it, it works for you. The brain studies you. And the brain says, Jai seems to be really interested in this thing. You know what? Let's start to help Jai remember. Let's start to produce the necessary dendrites that start spreading out to other neurons to make this a stronger connection. But then let's say that, no, nah, this doesn't really matter to me. Oh, I've heard the eight health laws before. I know them. I can name them. So they're in there, but guess what they're not doing? They're not growing. And here are individuals, they come to the seminar, and many of us, and I am the same, whether, and it could say any part of our lives. We come to seminars, we come to these meetings, and we, ha we are just as a tree. We have a choice. Do we want to keep hearing, or are we ready to do? 
And if you're ready to do, this leads us to the other one, and we'll get back into sleep for another reason. But if you want to do another driver of a uh, facilitator of neuroplasticity is actually doing. One of the best, I was talking to a neuroscientist, you know, Eric could, Eric was kind of my wingman in trying to find this guy. Uh, and, I, and I got to finally talk, I mean, neuro, um, neurologist, thank you, Ashwin, thank you. Uh, we've been that 20 times. Uh, this neurologist, <coughs> and I was talking to him, and first of all, I asked him, you've done, you know, you've studied the brain, you've done all these things. If you could choose one thing that blows you away about the mind, what would it be? Do you know what he said? That we can learn. I said, that's it? I was planning to come back to give y'all something great, by the way. But he says that the, the, the brain's ability to learn, but I, I thought, I was hoping for something, you know, like uh, was, um, that Naaman who thought, man, surely you should have come out here and strike and thunder come down. And I was like, every answer he given me, it was like this sim simple little thing. And I'm like, what is wrong? And this is coming from neurologists. So I had to step back and think, what am I missing? And friends, this is what blows me away, is that you have the, abi the, uh, the, the ability to learn and to be malleable, to learn something and to put it into practice, to, to change your, your thinking today if you choose. This is why the Bible says when? Today, if you hear his voice harden not your heart. He says don't wait for tomorrow because if you keep, if you keep waiting, your dendrites are going to become weaker in this area. And it takes time for dendrites to form. And if time is running out, then what do we need? We need every minute we can have with Jesus. We need every minute we could have to learn from him. Because I want as strong a connection in my neural pathways as I can have. And the more I do, have you, anybody ever just didn't feel like doing, but you did anyway? Let me give you, let me sum it up in one word. Parenting. Serena, am I right? I sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't feel like it, but what if I was to go with the feeling? Then I would have weaker synapses. But what if beside the feeling I do, the brain is almost like it's studying you. What's important to you is going to strengthen. And this is why I love what Dwayne Lemon was bringing out all these times with these questions. And you know, when Jesus asked these questions, you know what it made you do? It made you think. In a generation of individuals who really don't desire to think. When God is saying, come let us what? Reason together, says the Lord. So now is the time to build. But what are some of the detriments to neuroplasticity? Again, all my slides are gone, so don't even worry. I mean, I could pretty much close this now. So when it comes to neuroplasticity, learning, um, again, we mentioned with sleep, inefficient sleep also plays a part. So if I'm not sleeping correctly, then it begins to play a part. Um, and if I'm going to sleep too late, then that also plays a part. Now, alcohol is another detriment to neuroplasticity. Alcohol suppresses your REM sleep. REM sleep is that time of sleep, the rapid eye movement, right? That time of sleep where <coughs> your, your, your mind is consolidating, comparing all these folders, if you would, within a, within a jump drive. So, oh, praise God, I remember this now. Uh, so you have a jump drive. Everybody use a jump drive. Now, I'm talking to you. Guess what I'm doing to your brain? I'm loading it onto your jump drive. And you're a walking little jump drive. As you, you just heard this, you just heard that, you just heard that, and you want to keep it. I know you want to keep it. And now, sleep is your plug-in, where you say, let me take off the stuff of the jump drive, because if I don't, there comes a time when the drive gets too full, and guess what goes on? Nothing. You ever felt like that? Like, man, I'm, I'm in class, but I'm getting what? Nothing. There's too much on your jump drive. So what should we do? When you sleep, the body unloads the jump drive. It dumps it, and it goes through the brain, and it does this thing that we just talked about where it skips from neuron to neuron, and it goes deeper and deeper into the cortex. Now, interestingly enough, you have the gray matter and the white matter, which is interesting because gray matter in the brain is where? Anybody know? Outside or inside? Who says outside? Who says inside? Who says I don't know? The praise the Lord, nothing wrong with that. So let me, you know how you're going to remember? Remember how we say to learn, we have to make it interesting. Now, did you know that a tree reminds me of gray matter? It's what, what on the outside? Is it dark or light? It's dark. But what if I was to cut that tree? What is it on the inside? 
Oh, so gray matter is where? Outside. outside. Now I remember. Gray matter is on the outside. Your dendrite, your chemical synapses just got stronger. You just remember, by the grace of God, if you choose to go sleep on time and you don't drink alcohol and you eat a good diet, <laughs> and you eat a good diet your brain synapsis is going to say, oh, I remember now, my, my, my gray matter is on the outside, but on the inside is the white matter. Now, when you're going through these processes, right, your body is, again, trying to, to work with you. And I could go on and on, but I think in the simplicity of neuroplasticity, um, another thing I want to share with you before I move on to this last part is um, diet. Diet becomes important. But you saw it today. Now let's test what you learn. For those who are in church today, if you are in church, can you raise your hand? All right. Well, that's a lot of hands. It's a lot of tests. Who remembers what foods were good for the brain that Dr. Marvin talked about? Just give me one. So, nah, Dr. Yeah. I'm going to snip the neuron. So... Go ahead. Blueberries. blueberries. Now, blueberries are very good. It actually helps strengthen that myelin sheath, right? Who, who? Walnuts. Walnuts. Who is the little one that says walnut? Oh, that's my son. <laughs> you must be Jai's son. So, that's, that, so walnuts, right? And it strengthens the brain. What, what's another food? Broccoli. Say, broccoli. That's a good one. What's another one? Flaxseed. Flaxseed is an excellent one. Now, what's in flaxseed? Omega what? What number? Three. Three. And you had one? Velvet beans. Velvet beans. <laughs> or what was that? What was that the name of it? Merca? Makuna perines. Is there something called velvet beans? That's what, that's what the common name of that is. Okay, you see? So we just learn neuroplasticity. We're learning. <laughs> now go eat the beans. Don't forget that one because I can't even remember that one now when I just heard it. So, <laughs> so as you're learning, as these things are happening, as you're shouting out these things, guess what's happening? stronger synapses than if you didn't do this. This tells me when we go to church and we hear a good sermon, what should we do? Oh, we should share it, or if we can't go and share yet, we should do what among each other? Talk about it. And a neuron, it starts small, small connections, and then it gets bigger. That sounds to me like small groups, and then those groups do what? They get bigger and bigger. So when we have these neurons, you just mentioned that. Now, when it comes to your omegas, you want to keep those in balance. The average American is keeping your omegas, I think it's what, um, it's supposed to be, what, four to one ratio or three to one ratio, omegas, your omega ratio. But it, uh, the Ameri if I remember correctly with the last number, is like 32 to one because they eat high of inflammatory type, right? The, um, and Ashwin talked about that too in his allergy presentation. So those are the foods. You know the foods, so I, don't, I can skip the food part. You don't, don't drink alcohol, so I'm done with that part. You know that we should have one of the best biomarkers of neurological health for adults, especially as you get into to, to your senior citizen age, um, is actually consistent bedtimes. And I remember listening to this, this, this um, other neuroscientist, he was a neuroscientist, and he was saying it blew him away when just about three, about three or years ago or so where he found out that consistent bedtimes was actually a biomarker for health. And he actually started to do it. And I say, that blew you away. When we as a people heard that consistent bedtimes ought to be done? Since what, how, how long ago? Since the, the, the late, the middle to late 1800s. What if we would just believe the prophet? And this is where God is testing our obedience. If you obey, you shall prosper. That's why the God says, believe God, so shall you prosper. Believe his prophets, and so shall you be established. So now we're going to end with this. I want you to remember this. Remember, this is your last tree. This is the tree you are depending upon, the tree of life as it was right now, because if this tree goes, you have nothing else to eat. Just imagine, right? And now you have decisions to make in life. Because my, my biggest goal, my, my hope for you, friends, is when you come to seminars like this, that you don't leave the same. Now, it te neuroplasticity teaches you will not leave the same. But the question is, will you stay the same? Even as, as you leave, will you stay like how you left, that new you? And right now, you have a decision to make. Do I want to grow? Or do I want to decay? 
There is no tree on planet Earth that stays stagnant. There is no dendrite. There is no neuron that stays stagnant. Things are growing or things are decaying. And not all growth is good growth. Anybody ever had to have a tree that's growing too much? What do you do? Pruning. This is a pruning shear. That's interesting. How did I get that in my hand? So what I'm going to do is that very thing. When you have a decision to make about thoughts, and you're wondering, Lord, I need victory over this. God is saying, in my, my strength is sufficient for you. And if you just give me a chance, and if you would just do, you know what begins to happen as your brain sees that you're doing the good? It not only strengthens the good, but behind the scenes, it begins pruning the bad. But you know what begins to happen? We, we, we want the bad to just go like this. We want to start pruning here. But that bad didn't come there overnight. So what is God doing while you do that? He's taking you through the process, friends. And this pruning process is painful. That pain that you feel, that, that, that longing that you feel, whether it's for something that you long to eat, something that you long to do, some lust that you've been fighting over, that the neurons are there, but I guarantee you, the time that you're stopping it, the longer you delay from doing is the more pruning happening, which is weakening that, that um, dendrite. So every day you abstain from it is actually a day to say hallelujah because it has less strength from the day before. Amen. What do you say? That's a good God. And God says, you've been doing so good. Just, just keep going. I'm, I'm pruning. I'm, I'm training the brain. And you say, Lord, I don't know if I can. I'm going to do it here because I have to clean up after. Lord, I don't know if I can. And he's saying, no, you're almost there. It's been five days. And you said, oh, Lord, I don't know. It's been hard. Keep coming to me. And in the meantime, guess what is happening? The str you're strengthening the good ones. And then before you know it, what's happening? It's starting to bear leaves. And then when your mind focuses on this mindfulness, it focuses on this, less attention is being there, the brain actually does something interesting that, that neuroscien neuro uh, neuroscientists, neurologists, all of them that deals with the brain, all of them are saying it does something interesting. It almost begins to speed up the price. It says, no, he really doesn't want this thing now. We're, we're done. Can you imagine that, friends? This is victory, friends, is as you begin to do, as you begin to continue, then the brain sees you. The brain says, I see what you're doing. I see your endeavor as God is giving you the strength, and it just starts pruning away and pruning away and pruning away because they get, they get weaker and weaker. My brother. Often of his name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And and in closing, remember too, the other the other the other part of this could also happen. If you decide when you were pruning, no, I think I need to go back to it. Then you also begin strengthening that bad neuron. And then the longer you go into that direction is the longer it takes to come back. This is why God says, please, choose today to make the changes in your life. Choose today to make the changes of your body. Choose today to make the changes in your mind, because I miss you. And I want every neuron to know who I am, because an infinite God needs every neuron you have of a finite being to understand who he is. What do you say? So God says, I'll strengthen those neurons for you. I'll change your mind for you. But you have to give me time and you have to trust me. So I leave you with this branch to say that you, it is your choice. Choose you this day what you shall think. But know that your brain has the ability to change where you are. You are not a fixed adult. You can choose to change today. Thank you.
Can you all hear me? Great. No? All right, this, um, this presentation is on pharmacology and sanctification, two of my favorite subjects. No? Now? Hello? Turn off? It's on, yes. How's that? Is that better? All right, good. So these are two of my favorite um, topics, pharmacology and sanctification. In medical school, this was my favorite, pharmacology was my favorite um, subject, of course. And in the School of Christ, sanctification is my favorite course. Uh, so before we begin, let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for this rest period that you've given us, Lord, and for abiding with us and help us to even more abide with you. At this time, Father, we ask you to teach us. Come and dwell with us. Help us to learn more about sanctification, but also our healing as well through Christ. And I pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I always like to start with the word of Scripture, and the scripture is taken from Proverbs 4, verse 18. Can you hear me? The scripture says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Now, I think this has to do a lot with our sanctification, but there are also false concepts of sanctification out there as well. This is obviously the biblical concept but we have something called the grace alone concept, which says that, fall, which this is basically false sanctification, which says, I have already received victory through Christ over the errors of my life since I have accepted grace, the grace of God. But if I commit a sin, all I have to do is confess to a priest, pay a penance, purgatory, or indulgences. And obviously this is a false sanctification. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to a pastor. We can go straight to Christ. But then there's another side. Uh, this false sanctification concept says, I have already received the victory through Christ over my errors of my life since I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. So same foundation. But then they say this. There is nothing more to do but have faith as all the work was completed at the cross by God's grace. All the work was already completed. And this is also false gospel as well in regards to sanctification. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, the 10 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, not of works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So there are some works there, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now I'm going to go through this uh, false sanctification and and uh, dispel these concepts through going to the doctor and pharmacology. So you have crushing left-sided chest pain, and it radiates, it radiates down your, your left arm, radiates to your neck. What do you think we're having? A heart attack. And what do you do next? Well, you can take some cayenne pepper, but we're not, not going to go there right now. <laughs> doctor, I'm sick. I go to the doctor. The doctor does his, you know, uh, EEGs and, you know, EKGs and all these things. Um, they take your blood pressure, vitals, all these things, right? And then he comes up with a plan. And this plan has to do with, you know, taking a medication 
in order to get your heart back where it needs to be. Some metoprolol or some atenolol, whatever the medication is, they'll prescribe this, and this is a part of his plan. So basically, for you to get back to the healthy heart that you had previously before the heart attack, you need to take your daily med. You take your daily medication, and you get your, your healthy heart back, right? And every day you've got to take this medication, Monday, uh, Sunday to s Saturday, Sabbath. You've got to take your medication. Otherwise, you cannot get this healthy heart. And you can't stop halfway and say, oh, I feel better today. You've got to follow that doctor's plan, correct? The doctor says three months, and you feel better at the one-month mark. You've still got, you've got to take your medication up to three-month mark. You've got to follow that plan. And this, is, this pill is like your lifeline. You don't want another heart attack. So you've got to take your pill for their plan every day for three months or longer. And then one day you can go back out after three months. You can enjoy your life without having an issue of a heart. Now, every, every illness has a medication. So it's, I'm just talking about the heart, but every illness under the sun has a medication. And pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, the pharmaceutical company, they make a lot of money. It's big money. Revenue in prescription drug market is projected to reach the U.S. $1.09 trillion in 2024. Sometimes I think that I'm in the wrong business because you're making a lot of money from the pharmaceutical companies. Revenue is expected to show an annual growth rate of 4.1%, resulting in a market volume of $1.28 trillion by 2028. So it's getting, you're getting more money out of this. In global comparison, most revenue will be generated in the United States, US $358 billion, $0.9 billion in 2024. So the US makes more out of pharmaceutical drugs than any other country. And with drugs, there's every country on the planet, they're familiar, familiar with drugs or vaccines, right? Some people, they can't afford food, but they have a vaccine. Can't afford food but, or, or water, but you have something for your heart attack or, or heart pain. So, but especially in America, everyone runs on no, medications and supplements. It's, big, it's a big market. There's a supplement for this, there's a supplement for that, there's a medication for this, there's a medication for that. Everyone runs on medications. But did you know that medications, most, most of our medications, they come from plants? Plants have been used as a source of drugs for long ages. And as of today, approximately 70,000 species of plants have been screened for their potential utility as medicines. 70,000 species of plants have been used or have been screened, being screened for their use as medications. At present, about 8 out of 10 drugs used to treat infections, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, or immunosuppressives come as plants, come from plants directly or as derivatives. So for instance, as a derivative, I can extract something from white willow bark called salicylic acid, and I can use that or multiply in a lab and give you a pill. All right. Have you heard of this, this plant, Trigonella phainum gracum? Ever heard of this plant? You know, you ever, ever heard of it? It's, it's fenugreek. It's just fenugreek. So it's fenugreek, but from fenugreek, we can have different aspects, different phytochemicals from the plant itself, like alkaloids or saponins or volatiles, flavonoids. And we can extract these things, like for instance, the alkaloids are anti-diabetic. The alkaloids are also anti-migraine. The migraine gets some fenugreek. Uh, they're also antiviral and anti-tumor. The saponins are anti-cancer, uh, anti-obesity. The volatiles are antiseptic and analgesic as well. If you have pain, use some fenugreek. 
So all these things I can actually take, or rutin, rutin is also good for the eyes, quercetin, quercetin is good for your sinus issues. All these things I can get from one plant. But I can extract an alkaloid and put it in a pill. When I put it in a pill, I can help you with your diabetes, I can help you with your, your pain, your cancer, all these things, just from that one phytochemical. <laughs> and this is basically pharmacology, using things to make medicines. And the study of pharmacology basically shows us how these things interact with the body. What is pharmacology? So pharmacology, it says that it is a branch of medicine that deals with the interaction of drugs with the systems and processes of living animals. We are living animals. In particular, the mechanisms of drug action, as well as the therapeutic and other uses of the drug. So basically, how does that drug that I just created interact with the body? This is that study called pharmacology. With pharmacology, I can do an injection, I can swallow a pill, I can do, you know, uh, by the skin, transdermal, um, different ways of introducing the drugs to my body. And from there, I can measure the effects on the body, but before that, how is it distributed to the body? How much of this drug that I'm giving this person is distributed to each tissue, and especially the tissue that I want it to be impacted on? So, for instance, if I have a headache, how much of that drug or that, that uh, alkaloid is going to my, my head to stop the pain? But also you can have clinical effects as well. And we'll discuss more about this, but we're trying to mitigate the clinical effects while getting the appropriate response, stopping the headache or decreasing the risk of heart attacks. And pharmacokinetics is another part, another aspect to pharmacolo pharmacology. And it basically dictates or shows you how much of the drug is absorbed in your body and how it's distributed all throughout the tissues and how it is also metabolized by the, the liver. Every, almost every drug goes to the liver to be activated. So we've found a way to use a drug and use your body to actually activate that drug. And the liver, through its metabolism, can activate, can make active metabolites of that drug. But also, at the same time, it's also making that, that toxin that you're putting in your body, or the drug that you're putting in your body, sorry, it's a slip up, that you're putting into your body, I can make it, it, it makes it um, so that your body can get rid of it at the same time. So you can excrete it. So that's when the, the fourth aspect comes in. How much of this drug that I just took is being excreted by the body, either through urine or feces or so forth and so on? If I'm taking a pill, for instance, and it goes through the circulation, and again, it goes to the liver, and the liver activates it, and goes through systemic circulation just to stop my headache, uh, or stop my heart pain, or my uh, blood pressure. And through systemic circulation, the, the liver can act, inactivate it and send it to the kidneys to get rid of it, or even through sweat. I can get rid of most of this toxins through my sweat, or through my colon, through my kidneys, even through my breath as well. But again, your liver is very important, and I want you to keep, keep this in mind. Um, the liver can activate medications, and it, you, you actually need a healthy liver to activate the medication. So for instance, with lopinavir, this was used for COVID. And what they saw was lopinavir was was helpful in certain, er certain cases in helping others, to, I think people to, to not have long-term COVID or a uh, long course of COVID. But when they introduced lopinavir with someone who had, say for instance, a fatty liver, this led to the individual not being able to metabolize the drug, and then they had elevated plasma concentrations of lopinavir. And this led to severe side effects, like possible hep hepatotoxicity. You can damage your liver, or heart issues, QT interval prolongation, or pancreatitis. So you're taking the medication, hoping to get rid of COVID, and you're getting pancreatitis. 
because you don't have an active or healthy liver. So this is just to and I keep this in mind. I look at the liver as why do we call the liver the liver? Huh? It's a filter, but why do we call the liver the name liver? Why do we call it the liver? Yeah, liver gives life. It's without the liver you would die essentially. Liver, I guess that's one of the neuroplasticity thing. Liver, live. Okay, that's it's not. It was funny in medical school. I guess it was not funny here. <laughs> but without the liver, honestly, you would die. There are three important organs, three most vital organs. Can you name them? The heart, the brain, the liver. You can be on dialysis, right? But you cannot be on, you know, a heartalysis. You got, you need a. <laughs> You need a heart, you need a brain, you also need a liver. This, this is a very vital organ, but the liver represents something. The liver can actually regenerate itself. You can damage the liver and it regenerates. And if you think about the gospel, the gospel is all about regeneration, right? The soul is regenerated. So think about the liver in its uh, spiritual aspect. It actually represents the life or the soul when God created man, in Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living liver. Soul, okay, living soul. But think about the liver as a soul, and God wants to regenerate that. But without this liver, you cannot activate certain medications, the physical liver, that is. And also, we can go to pharmacokinetics. And pharmacokinetics also speaks of, you know, what's the dosage that I need to have an effect? Because since the liver is trying to get rid of this toxin from my body or this drug from my body, what is the effective dose that will impact the body but not lead to severe clinical effects? So you can get like metoprolol three times daily or whatever, five times daily, or take it before meals, so forth and so on. This is how we get those, those numbers. But I want you to think about this. Um, this is a known graph. Uh, this is a response graph, a drug dose versus response graph. And this is known for every drug. Think about the green line. The green line talks about the therapeutic effect. And the purple line talks about the toxic effect. And the red line speaks of the lethal effect. And obviously, you don't want the lethal effect. But I want you to take a closer look at the therapeutic range. And the therapeutic range is the ideal range where you can get the effect of the drug to have the impact on the certain organ that I want to, to be impacted, wants to be impacted. And the purple line is the toxic effect. Now what do you notice about these two lines? I, I'll try to highlight that for you. So the therapeutic range, there's two lines crossing the therapeutic range. There's a therapeutic effect line, and there's also the toxic effect line. What does that mean? See, the, you're not even a pharmacologist, but you can pick it up. Every drug has a side effect. Every drug has a side effect. It's the most benign drug on the planet that has a side effect. Of course, you don't want a lethal effect. If you take more of this drug, you can have the lethal effect, but every drug on the planet has a side effect. And doctors will say, you know, the benefits outweigh the risk. The benefits of you decreasing the risk of your heart attack um, outweighs the risk of you getting, you know, suicidal ideations. But every drug has an effect, has a toxic effect. Every drug known to man. And we've studied the lethal toxic, toxicity or toxic dose, for instance, something that is less than five milligrams per kilograms is 
uh, or, or less than five milligrams per kilograms is extremely toxic. So you take something that's five milligrams per kilogram and you, you, know, you can have severe um, toxicity causing death, for instance. Uh, or something that is over 15,000 milligrams per kilograms is relatively harmless, like even water. Water is, you can have a toxic effect with water. And we have a poison scale. Of course, water is on a one level of one. Um, but you have things on there like caffeine. Caffeine is somewhere there around the three or four. So you can actually have a, a lethal dose of caffeine, lethal dose of nicotine. Um, or the, on this graph is botulinum, botulinum toxin. Um, who's ever heard of that? Who's ever heard of Botox? Yeah, who's ever, no, don't ask that question. <laughs> but you, you can in, inject yourself with Botox, something very, very, very um, toxic, but only in small amounts, just small amounts. But in large amounts, in any drug, you can kill yourself. Uh, Tylenol, aspirin, you name it, any drug out there on the market, there's a lethal dose for every drug. Of course, certain drugs are more lethal than others, but all drugs have a lethal dose. Jeremiah 46 verse 11 says this, Go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. There's no cure in these medications. And the thing is, the Bible's been telling, telling this to us for centuries. And, and I also want to make, I want to be clear, in Egypt, Egypt, or ancient Egypt, what were they using? Were they using medications? Well, of course, they call it medication, but what were they using in particular? Herbs. In vain you can use your fenugreek, thou shalt not be cured. In vain shall you use your metformin, thou shalt not be cured. The cure is not in this thing. But we often think about, you know, we often think that there's a cure in clinical medicine and the medications that they give. Who knows this, uh, this word? Strong's G5331, who knows this word? It's Greek. Pharmakia. Pharmakia. You know what that means? A pharmakia means this, the use or the administration or ministering of drugs, poisoning. Sorcery, magical arts, often found in a connection with idolatry and fostered by it. It's a metaphor, the deceptions and seductions of idolatry. I want you to focus on that poisoning. I can inject botulinum, botulinum toxin into you in small doses. But I'm introducing the toxin, basically poisoning the body. And for these medications, you know, sometimes they'll say you have to be on this medication for the rest of your life. And you think you're getting closer and closer to health when you're actually going in the opposite direction. And you go on one medication, then you have to get another, get another medication just to take care of the side effects of that one medication. And why is this important? What's the cause of disease? Well, I, from my background, I think sin is the cause of disease, right? Without sin, there's no disease. And God is basically trying to get, out, uh, get us out of this sin situation. But when, I, when we have diseases, we often go to get medications. And medications is taught it as trying to help us to treat one disease, but it ends up giving us another disease or even two more diseases. So in, in essence... You're in a continual cycle of disease. And if you're in a continual cycle of disease, that means you're in a continual cycle of the thing that causes disease. You're in a continual cycle of sin. Now, who wants to keep you in a continual cycle of sin? It's slow poisoning. It's actually making you worse, not better. Pharmaceuticals never cure. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 13 says, For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause. Thou, sh 
that thou sh may, mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if you have, uh, you're on medications, go home and throw out everything, put everything in the, the garbage or in the toilet. This is not what I'm saying. But we should aim to have a better plan. You know, make a covenant with God in order to come off these things that actually don't help. And at the end of the day, um, the entire world is, is leaning towards or, or using these things. Marcus Aurelius once said that the object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but the object of life is, is actually to resist being on the side of the insane. When you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and again, and you're not getting a solution, that's called insanity. And we, we have medications upon medications, chemotherapy upon medica um, on chemotherapy. There was a study that, um, a recent study that showed that from 2020 to 2050, there'll be an increase in cancer death, cancer rates, just incident rates, rates by 77%. And every year we have a fight against cancer. We make new drugs and new, these new things to find cancer or to fight it. But we're not getting better. It's insane. Over and over and over again, and these things are causing more harm than good. Now again, I'm, also, I'm saying, don't go out and throw out your metoprolol. That can, you can have very bad effects because of that. Like rebound hypertension, for instance. That's a severe side effect from stopping your metoprolol too early. Or rebound, rebound tachycardia. Your heart can you know, beat faster than it should. That's not what I'm saying. But just understand what you're doing. You're not curing disease. You're just managing it and causing more harm. What's better? This is from Desire of Ages. It says, in the Savior's manner of healing, the, there was lessons for his disciples. On one occasion, he anointed the eyes of a blind man with clay and bade him go wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing, John 9, verse 7. The cure could be wrought only by the power of the great healer, yet Christ made use of the simple agencies of nature. While he did not give countenance or support to drug medication, he sanctioned the use of simple and natural remedies. To many of the afflicted ones who received healing, Christ said, Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. John 5, verse 14. Thus he taught that disease is the result of violating God's laws, both natural and spiritual. The great misery in the world would not exist did men but live in harmony with the Creator's plan. Are we following God's plan or someone else's plan? God wants us to heal. And he has simple remedies for us to heal. What is God's plan for your life? I think about this in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 4, 4, verse 3 to 5. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Again, the world is following a plan. And we should be, as children of God, following his plan. And his plan leads to our sanctification. This is from the upward life. It says, our sanctification is God's object in all his dealings with us. He has chosen us from eternity that we may be holy. Christ gave himself for our redemption. That through our faith in his power to save from sin, we might be made complete in him. In giving us his word, he has given us bread from heaven. He declares that if we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we shall receive eternal life. 
Why do we not dwell more upon this? Why do we not strive to make it easily understood when it means so much? Why do not Christians open their eyes to see the work God requires them to do? This is the means to our health. Mind, body, and soul, God has, God's will is for our sanctification, to be healed. Sanctification is a, pro, is, a, is a progressive work of a lifetime. The Lord declares this is the will of God, even your sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. It is, is it your will that you desire, your desires and inclinations shall be brought into conformity to the divine will? God demands of us perfect obedience to his law. You know, we can't have sanctification without knowing how we're escaping sin. And without the law, we don't know what is sin. Paul says, when the law came, I died. The law points to our sins. So if there's any, any uh, entity preaching or it's telling us we don't need to honor God's law, that's false sanctification. It's false healing. God demands of us perfect obedience to his law. The expression of his character. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Romans 3 verse 31. The law is the echo of God's voice saying to us, holier, yes, holier still. Desire the fullness of the grace of Christ. Yea, long hunger and thirst after righteousness. The promise is ye shall be filled. Let your heart be filled with an intense longing for this righteousness. The work of which God's word declares is peace and its effect. Quietness and assurance forever. God wants to give us peace. And like I said, name a disease. I always joke. What, name a disease that brings us peace. And name one. If you name one, I want, I want that one. Can you name one? There's no disease that brings peace. God wants us to live a disease-free life. Not a life that you treat one disease and you get another disease. And he points to the great physician. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. You're taking a medication, there's no rest. Christ is the doctor of our sanctification. We should go to him. Say, doctor, I am sick. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ is the means, the only means to our sanctification. Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 27 says, Christ loved the church and loved you and gave himself for you, that he might sanctify and cleanse you with the washing of the water by the word that he might present you to himself a glorious person, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that you should be holy and without blemish. It didn't say have a disease here and have a disease there and without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. This is from Desire of Ages. It says, the world is a lazar house or a hospital, essentially. But Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength, in himself. Yet we're taking a pill. Christ is the means to our health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed with demons, he turned away none who came to receive his healing. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves. Yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when the virtue from Christ entered into these, these poor souls, the virtue of Christ, not metformin, 
not metopolo, when the virtue of Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease, as well as their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? Why do you think we don't receive the same results today? We lack faith. We don't see any efficacy in Christ. We have evidence-based medicines that says uh, metoprolol helps with the heart, but we don't see how Christ can help with the heart. And if there's no evidence-based medicine, we say, oh, no, 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 I don't, I'd rather go with this. Don't tell me about that. Don't tell me about Christ. Tell me about how metoprolol changes my heart. And what is our sickness? Psalm, one, Psalm 19, verse 12 and 13, one of my favorite psalms. It says that, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant from also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the, the great transgression. We are all sick. We all have secret faults. We all have errors. We all are prone to presumptuous sins. But in knowing this, we can go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I am sick. I have a heart problem. Psalm 51, verse 10 and 12 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Doctor, I have a heart problem. Create in me a clean heart. And I, I, I love the, the, um, the centurion. He says, God, just speak the word, and I know that my servant shall be healed. And David is saying, create in me. This all points to God as the creator in the beginning when he says, let there be light, and there was light. And you can ask, God, create in me a clean heart, and there will be a clean heart. You don't have to wait. But then this doctor comes up with a plan. When you come to him, he gives you a plan. And the plan, he gives you a prescription. What's the prescription? Then Jesus said unto, unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat, of, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye, shall, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, as I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. If you have this bread, if you have this drink, you shall live forever. You shall have life, and it more abundantly. And Christ is not be saying, you know, you should be a cannibal and eat flesh and drink blood. That's not what he's saying. What is he saying? Eat his word. God's spill, God's pill is the gospel, and it, the gospel comes from the word. Take it every day. Matthew 6 verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. Every day you can take God's pill, the gospel. Take the gospel daily. I ask God for a word today for me. What is the word that leads to my healing today? And he will give it to you. The prayer for daily bread includes not only food, that, food to sustain the body, but that spiritual bread which will nourish the soul unto everlasting life, of life everlasting. Jesus bids us, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. John 6, verse 27. 
He says, I am the, the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Our Savior is the bread of life, and it is by beholding his love, by receiving it in the, into the soul, that we feed upon the bread which came down from heaven. We receive Christ through his word. And the Holy Spirit is given to open the word of God to our understanding and bring home his truths to our hearts. We are to pray day by day that as we read his word, God will send his spirit to reveal to us the truth that will strengthen our souls for the day's need. In teaching us to ask every day, every day, for what we need, both temporal and spiritual blessings, God has a purpose to accomplish for our good. He would have us realize our dependence upon his constant care for he is seeking to draw us into communion with himself. In this communion with Christ, through prayer and the study of the great and precious truths of his word, we shall as hungry souls be fed, and those that, are, that thirst, we shall be refreshed at the fountain of life. It's from the Thousand of Mountain Blessings, page 112. So how can we receive Christ daily? How can we receive healing daily? Through his word. John 17, verse 17 to 20, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Think about the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And this guy didn't know Jesus Christ from Adam. Didn't know him. But it's a strange interaction. Very strange interaction. Some guy walks up to you and says, oh, get up and walk. Random guy. Get up and walk. John 5, verse 5 and 6 talks about this strange interaction. It says, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Thirty-eight years this guy was sick. Could not walk. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And some guy walks up to you and you're in your wheelchair and he says, Some random guy. Don't know him. Wilt thou be made whole? What would you say? That's a strange interaction. Like, I don't know you. Just put me in the water. I don't know you. Just put me in that water. And that's what he said. The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, get some hydrotherapy. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up that bed and walk. A strange interaction. And immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. What cured this man? He did not know Jesus. Did not hear, he probably heard of his miracles, but did not know that this was a man that, that, did, that performed miracles. What cured this man? Obedience to his word. He said, pick up your bed and walk. And immediately this man who obeyed his word was able to walk. But it wasn't just a physical healing. He was made whole. Mind, body, and soul. And so it is with us. We can be made whole today. And with these medications, we cannot be made whole with these medications. You can try all you want. I love this verse, or this this quote from Ministry of Healing. It says, when the, gospel is received in its, is, when the gospel is received in its purity and power, it is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin. Name all the maladies that originated in sin. Oh, no, sorry. Name the maladies that didn't originate in sin. That's probably an easier, an easier thing. Every malady, every disease originated in sin. When we receive the gospel in its purity and its power, we can be healed of every malady that originated in sin. 
So I've got to ask myself, where in my life am I not receiving this gospel? Where? Daily, ask yourself, where am I not receiving this gospel in my life? Otherwise, I'm still sick. You can be without a diagnosable disease, you're still sick. Where in my life am I not, rec am I not receiving the gospel in its purity and power? The Son of Righteousness arises with healing in his wings. Malachi 4, verse 2. Not all the world bestows can heal a broken heart or impart peace of mind or remove care or banish disease. Fame, genius, talents, all are powerless to gladden the sorrowful heart or to restore the wasted life. The life of God in the soul in ma is man's only hope. The love which Christ diffuses through the whole being is a vitalizing power. Every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerve, the liver, it touches with healing. By its highest energies of the being, by it, the highest energies of the being are roused to activity. It frees the soul from the guilt of sorrow, the anxiety of care that crushes the life forces. With it comes serenity and composure. It implants in the soul joy, nothing earthly, that nothing earthly can destroy. Joy in the Holy Spirit, health-giving, life-giving joy. Who needs this health? It's available. On God's plan, this is available for each and every one of us. And listen to the pharmacokinetics. What is the end of the gospel? What's the pharmacokinetics of the gospel? Isaiah 32, verse 17 says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. You take this pill, and what does it give you? Peace and assurance forever. It absorbs in your body. The word absorbs in your body. It doesn't affect your liver. It actually changes your liver. It changes your life. But it also has an impact on your brain, has an impact on your headaches, has an impact on your heart, impact on your, your heart diseases, has an impact on all life. Every single cell. It can, it can change it positively. And there's no side effects. What's the greatest miracle that Christ ever performed? Raising Lazarus. Raising Lazarus? Water. Sorry? Walking the water? water? Changing the heart. I like that. There's a quote from this person called Leonard Ravenhill. He says, The greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world and make that man holy and put him back into that unholy world and keep him holy in it. That is the greatest miracle. Not to keep you from having a heart attack next week. He wants to keep you holy, to sanctify you, put you back in an unsanctified world, and keep you sanctified in it. The path of the just is as a shining light each day. The end of, a, of the gospel is a clean life. A clean and renewed life. John 15 verse 3 says, Now ye are clean through the metformin. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Are you hearing God's voice? Individually we can hear God's voice. We don't have to go to another person. Not a priest, not a prelate, not an evangelist. We can go to God individually. We don't have to pay money without cost, without price. We can go to him. Say, God, cleanse me through thy word. Give me a word today. I need this word today. Each day. Why do we hesitate? I was talking to a friend of mine, and he's having a problem sleeping, and he said for weeks he's been trying to change his habits, and he kept going back and forth. He's on Instagram. He says, I'm the only octogenarian that is on Instagram, possibly. And uh, he says he listens to different individuals on Instagram. And he says, I can't sleep. I, I'm trying to sleep, but I, I, I fall into these bad habits. And I said to him, have you spoken to God about it? He says, 
No, I haven't. I haven't spoken to God about it. We always forget that. But then we take the melatonin and we take the things, the trazodones and all these to God and say, God, help me with this. He who is faithful in the least is also faithful in much. And God is very faithful in the little, little things. But when we receive the word, we must be willing to take it all. Not some of it, not three quarters of it, not 99.9% .9 of it, all of it. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 to 17 says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much? All scripture. Not some. Can't say, I know some people are, are New Testament Christians, and some people are Old Testament Christians, and some people are Psalm Christians. In Jamaica, we just read the Psalms. But all of it is important. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Those to all who receive the Sabbath as a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power it will be a delight. Seeing Christ in it, they delight themselves in him. The Sabbath points them to the, cre to the works of creation as an evidence of his mighty power and redemption. While it calls to mind the lost peace of Eden, it tells of peace restored through the Savior. And every object in nature repeats his invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. You go to Christ, he's not going to say, don't keep the Sabbath. It's an opportunity for us to heal. The Sabbath is an opportunity for us to heal, to be sanctified. I have given them my Sabbath for what? For our sanctification. So we ignore God's Sabbath, we cannot be sanctified. Anyone who's preaching, saying that we don't have to follow God's command, especially the fourth commandment, is hindering you from being sanctified. But also, take all of it, but take as directed. Um, there can be a lethal dose sometimes of the eating Bible truth. Second Peter 3 verse 15 says, as also in his, as apostles, speaking about Paul's writing, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. How does something that is supposed to lead to your sanctification, your healing, leads to your destruction? You're taking it in the wrong way. They're unstable. They're unstable. You're resting with scriptures that you don't understand and twisting it, basically. Yeah, you're not supposed to eat the pages, basically. So don't do that. But you can have an unintended dose, unintended overdose of God's word. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, the theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving or the sanctification of the soul. It does not bring forth the fruits of righteousness. A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in life. The darkest chapters of history are burdened with a record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. The Pharisees, for instance, they claimed to be children of Abraham and boasted of their possessions of the oracle of God 
Yet these advantages did not preserve them from selfishness, malignity, greed for gain, and base, the basest hypocrisy. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world, but their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify the Lord of glory. They knew the books from Genesis to Malachi. They had extra biblical works as well, and they crucified the Christ who they were looking for. But the same danger exists today. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they sub subscribe to certain theological tenets. But they have not brought the truth into practical life. They have not believed and loved it, loved the truth. Therefore, they have not received the power and grace that comes through sanctification of the truth. Many men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly minded, it is a curse to its possessors. And through their influence, it is a curse to the world. The same thing that heals someone can also be the same thing that can be a curse to another. But what, why are we sanctified? Colossians 1 verse 27 and 28 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is in you, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Why, do we, why are we sanctified? It is to reach others, to be a vessel used for the sanctification of others. The teaching of Christ was the expression of an inwrought conviction and experience, and those who learn of him become teachers after the divine order. When you join the ranks of those called Christians, we preach what is in our hearts. If you have Christ in you, you're going to preach Christ. God, spoken by one who is himself sanctified through it, has a life-giving power that makes it attractive to the hearers and convicts them that it is a living reality. When one has received the truth in the love of it, he will make this manifest in the persuasion, persuasion of his manner and the tones of his voice. You're changed. He makes known that which he himself has heard, seen, and handled of the word of life, that others may have fellowship with him through the knowledge of Christ. His testimony from lips touched with a live coal from off the altar is truth to the receptive heart and works sanctification upon the character. He can be used as a means of sanctifying another person. I'll close with a scripture from Titus 2, verse 11 to 13. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared, appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Not the world to come, this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The plan that God has for us is our sanctification. And obviously you can see it through the pharmacology model. But God doesn't deal with medications in regards to our sanctification. God deals with his words every day. Take his word, take the gospel every day. That is the means to our sanctification. I pray that you are blessed by this. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments? No? That was good? All right, great.
Oh, yes. Die daily. Yes. The word of God can help you to die to self. It can be lethal to the, the old men, for sure. All right. Um, so we'll be back at 6, 7, 7 o'clock. 5. 5.15. No, I think it's 7 o'clock, right? Oh, right, right, right. Okay, 515. Um, all right, sounds good. Um, that should be good. Well, all heal. Uh, from the maladies that resulted from sin, not just physically, Lord, but mentally and spiritually as well. Help us, Lord, even now to be partakers of this new heart. Bless us, Father, that each day we can fill our hearts with the love of your truth each day. Give us your words, Father. Speak to our hearts your words even now. Bless us that we may be a blessing unto others as well. As we separate from each other, Lord, please don't separate from us. May your spirit go with us and abide us even to the end of this day and even to the close of our lives or the close of world's history. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Is, is it all right to start, or do we need to wait for others? Oh, let's get it going. All right, let's get it going. Um, I am very happy to be with you all this afternoon, where we can get a chance to do some question and answer. Uh, let me give some groundwork before we get started and have a word of prayer. Uh, the first thing I want to say is I have to inform you of something that might come across as bad news, but I am inclined to tell you, and that is, I do not know everything. <laughs> So I, I'm sorry if that disappoints you, <laughs> but um, I'm just here to let you know I do not know everything. So um, that very well means you might ask a question that I don't have an answer to, because what I will not do is I won't give you my opinion. I'm going to give you God's word. I'm going to give you God's statements from inspiration, but I will not give you my opinion. So if, if I don't have something to reference, then I promise you I will just say, I don't know, that's a great question. Here's my email, here's my phone number. Let's follow back up and I'll make sure I get the answer. So if I don't have the answer, one promise I'll give you is I'll get the answer, all right? That's uh, number one. Number two is it is perfectly okay for us to disagree. But it is not okay for us to be disagreeable. Are, we, are you with me on that? All right, we can disagree, I'm fine with that. Okay, I'm still growing, you're still growing. None of us have arrived. So it's, if, if you ask a question, I don't have an answer to it, or if I give an answer, you say, I don't agree with that. I'll say, okay, no problem. But, you know, and vice versa. You might give an answer, I'll say, well, I don't agree with you, but thank you for sharing, you know, or what have you. But I, I will make sure to do that. Um, lastly, I don't believe that the pulpit is a place to demonstrate opportunities for stroking a man's ego. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, is that you might ask a question that I don't have the answer to, but you do have the answer to it. I don't want you to feel that you cannot give the answer because it's going to make the evangelist look bad. It's going to make it look like I don't know what I'm talking about. Like I just told you, I don't know everything. So if you, if you have the answer, I think what's way more important is getting the answer. It doesn't matter who gives it. So if you have the answer, even though I don't, Hey, amen. Just remember, don't give your opinion. I have plenty of those. So don't give your opinion. But if you have an answer, give your answer. Because at the end of the day, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, let all things be done unto edifying. Everything is about edifying, building up, and that is our goal. I think if we follow these simple uh, rules of engagement in our Q&A session, we're going to have a very healthy question and answer session. Amen. All right, so with that being stated, I only have one, and then I got a text for two, as far as two questions. If there are more written questions, please feel free to bring those questions up front. Otherwise, just raise your hand. The microphone will be given to you by our sisters here, and uh, you can go ahead and ask your question, and we're going to see where the Lord takes us. So why don't we go ahead and start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right into our Q&A session. So let's pray together, okay? Our loving Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the blessing once again that we can study your wonderful words of life and that we can learn what is truth. Lord, I know that there are many perplexing questions that's on the hearts of your people. I ask that you will please give us wisdom that exceeds our years and that you might bless us that as we study together that we will come up higher on Jacob's ladder. Lord, I also pray that you will fulfill your words in John 14, 26, that you will allow the Comforter, your Holy Spirit, to teach us and also to bring to remembrance what has been learned. And so I ask that you'll do that even now and supply the needs to your people according to your will. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we have two questions. I'll go ahead and start with what's written down uh, because that's right in front of me. So the first question was dealing with the quote that I gave you earlier in Revelation 8, 3 and 4. If you remember, for those of us who are studying together this week, we talked about the sanctuary. And when we talked about the sanctuary, we talked about the articles of furniture in the sanctuary, one of which was the altar of incense. And if you remember, I asked all of you what constituted the incense. The great majority of us, the great number of us, said that the incense represented prayer. 
But then I took you to Revelation 8. Now, I want us to go back there. So let's take our Bible. Let's go to Revelation 8. Let's see what the Bible says there. Revelation, we're going to chapter 8. And let's see what the text says there. Uh, Revelation 8, we're looking at verses 3 and 4. So I disagreed with the idea of summarizing the incense as the prayers of the saints because Revelation 8 verse 3 says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. So again, we see that the incense was separate from the prayers of the saints. We saw it again in verse 4. Verse 4 says, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angels' hands. So the incense is something that is separate, independent from the prayers of the saints. So the question is, what constitutes the incense? Well, we get one clue in the book of Ephesians. Let's go to chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, we can get an idea of something that could connect with the incense. If you look at the apothecary that was spoken of in the book of Exodus when God first told the children of Israel to not only make up the structure of the sanctuary, but specifically help put together the incense. Um, one of the things that that incense was supposed to be was a sweet smelling savor. It was supposed to be something very sweet smelling and precious before God. Well, when we look at Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2, we see that the Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a what? Sweet smelling savor. Follow that? Mm -hmm. So this is what we call the merits of Christ. These are the works of Christ. This is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, with that, we have a beautiful statement here that I want you to take a look at. When we learn about the sanctuary, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. When we study it, watch this. We're told, pertaining to the incense, this wonderful statement from the book Christ Object Lessons, page 156. It says, by his spotless life, his obedient, his death on the cross of Calvary, Christ interceded for the lost race. And now, not as a mere petitioner does the captain of our salvation intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. His offering is complete, and as our intercessor, he executes his self-appointed work, holding before God, notice, the censer containing his own spotless merits and the prayers, confessions, and thanksgiving of his people, perfumed with the fragrance of his what? Righteousness. Righteousness. These ascend to God as a sweet savor. The offering is wholly acceptable, and pardon covers all transgression. So the incense represents the merits of Christ. It represents the spotless character of Christ. That's what the incense represents. And the incense, when it's mingled with our prayers, this is what makes our prayers acceptable to God. Now, what's the, what's, what's the beautiful lesson in this? What, what's the encouragement that comes from this? I used to think that the better you prayed, the more fluent your words, the more excellent your oratory. I used to think that's what impresses God. And God is here to remind us that you can't impress him with words because he's the creator of words. What impresses God is when we recognize who he is and recognize who we are. If I think that I can come before God because my words are so fluent and so powerful and I have excellent oratory and excellent articulation and enunciation and the rest, if I think that all of that stuff is what gets in the presence of God, then I am still functioning on a saved by works and also creature merit basis. And I don't need his righteousness, which I received by faith. But you can stutter and you can have all sorts of problems with your language. You can suffer terribly in putting together your speech. But when you come saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. 
There's nothing that I can bring to you that can impress you or make me found acceptable in your sight. But I come not in my name, but I come in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking that you will hear my cry and attend unto my prayer. Those prayers are always heard by God. The incense represents the spotless merits, the works of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Do we understand that? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that's question number one. Question number two. And I, 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 don't, I don't need to know who wrote this, but this is, verily in, this is very interesting. Now, let me do a quick scan in the room. Let's see. All right. Okay. I'll do my best. It says, in regards to marital relations. Do you understand why I had to do the scan? Now, what I'm going to try to do is I'll try to speak in code because, you know, we got, some, we got some folks here that they, it's too early for them to learn this. It says, in regard to marital relations, do you know anything about the three-day principle? <laughs> By a show of hands. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're comfortable, if you're okay answering this, because you, you might reveal you're the one who wrote the question. But um, does anybody know the three-day principle? Anybody understand the three-day three principle? Oh, boy. Oh, should I even? Okay, so here's the question. The question is, in regards to marital relations, do you know anything about the three-day principle? And my answer is yes. I, I, know, I know what this is talking about, okay? Basically, this is talking about marital relations being spaced out by at least three days. What? Yeah. Yep. Spaced out by three days. Okay, so let me get into this a little bit. I'm going to get into this a little bit. I said a little bit. All right. In the book Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, this is a book that obviously should be read by all married couples. Okay? If you're married or if you're considering marriage, you should read the book Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Sexual Behavior, Marriage and Divorce. Now, in this book, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not hard. It's not a long book. You know, you can get through it fairly quickly. Um, but I would recommend that it's read, especially, again, by married couples and people who are preparing for marriage. Now, there is a point where she talks about, the inspiration talks about excess. Yeah. Excess in the privilege in marriage, yeah. okay, in marital relations. She talks about excess. And the only thing that she talks about, she doesn't contextualize what excess is. And that's where the frustration comes in, and that's where also the fanatics are having a field day with this, because... Now people are coming up with their own weird concepts and ideas on what constitutes excess. Well, one of the ideas, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to say this is fanatical per se, but we could talk about it. And th I think this is a good place to talk about it because we have some physicians here who understand physiology. The idea is this. Every time a man reaches the height, you get where I'm coming from? Okay. Every time a man reaches the height, that it takes approximately two to three days for his levels to return back to normal. Ellen White used a word called substance. She used a word called substance, that when a man loses this substance, then, uh, you know, things can happen. This is, she was specifically talking about those who practice self-abuse. And she was talking about the dangers of it. Now, with this releasing of substance, she talked about how there's all this suffering that a person can go through, mental problems, uh, a depleted immune system, and the list goes on. Well, it was later on that modern day science began to study a little bit more, and they discovered that the substance, and this is where it's more of a hypothesis, it's not actually proven, but the, the conclusion, the deduction that was made, especially in Adventist circles, is that the substance was referring to zinc. Zinc. Because men have a lot of zinc in their substance when they reach the height. Following so far? Yeah. All right. So the idea is that that zinc depletion that happens on Monday will not return back to a normal state until approximately Wednesday or Thursday. 
Therefore, it is concluded, and it is a conclusion. It's a deduction. We cannot make this law. At least you shouldn't. But the idea is that men and women in the marriage covenant should space out their relations by three days, which would basically mean only twice a week, approximately, and we get a lot of protests, especially from men. We get a lot of protests about it. Brothers are like, I'm not happy with that counsel. So, you know, basically, this is what I am assuming this person is asking, is not only have you heard about it, but what do you think about it? Um, This is taught at some of our institutes, okay? Some of our institutes. You go to Meet Ministry, they're going to talk about this. Uh, I think they teach this, Dr. Nedley, over at Weimar and other places. They they talk about this spacing out. Um, You know, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, It's not that I don't have a lot more to say because, seriously, I actually did a very thorough Bible study on marital relations and what God says about it, et cetera, et cetera. I have a YouTube channel. I'll be talking to you about that later on tonight, and that's going to be one of the programs that we're going to put up on the YouTube channel is what does God have to say about SEX? What does God have to say about it? And the reason why is because, again, we've done a horrible job when it comes to talking about this. And we're treating it like it's so dirty that even God leaves the room when it's done. And it's like this, this is, that's our perverted minds. That's, that's our perverted mind. God created it. Amen. So we, we got to stop that. It's like, no, what we have done is we have brought our perversions from the world. We brought it into our marriages. And we think that even God is like, okay, let me leave the room and let you do this and that. And then I'll come back when you're finished because it's so dirty. And, and that's, that's horrible. That, that's just the impact of the world. Intimacy is very beautiful. It is wonderful. It is a creation of God. And when it's done in the right context, it's actually God glorifying. But the problem is, is we don't talk about it. And most of us come from the world of perversion. And as a result of that, we treat it like it's dirty. So, you know, we got to debunk that because, again, the world has no problem talking about it. And I know tons and tons and tons of SDAs that are going to the world for that false education. They should be able to come here for the true education, even on such a subject as this. All right. All right. So that answers that question. I have no more questions. Now, if you have a question, slip your hand in the air. We'll go ahead and acknowledge your hand and then we'll go ahead and take your question. Let's see what the Lord can provide for us. You are welcome to ask questions about what we talked about this week. You are also welcome to ask questions of what we did not talk about this week. If it's on your heart and you want to ask then go ahead and ask. I am not afraid of any question because I'm not afraid to tell you I don't have the answer. So that's my comfort zone. But if you have a question, Brother Siraj, go ahead. Then we'll go ahead and see if the Lord can help us to provide an answer. So let's see what God says. All right, here goes our first question from the floor. Is it possible that um, many of the early uh, pioneers of the church did not really have a clear understanding on, um, on the education that you said the church has done a horrible thing. Yeah. So should we um, actually characterize them as doing a horrible job, or is it because they didn't read or we didn't read? What is it? Yeah, good question. So first of all, our pioneers definitely did not touch on a lot of these subjects. Um, Mrs. White didn't say a whole lot on this subject. She said, she said some things for sure. She put out a lot of warnings and things of that nature. Not all of it was carefully delineated, you know, defined. But at the same time, we are not called to avoid introducing more light. We are warned against allowing new light to cancel old light. So watch the principle in Proverbs 4. Go to Proverbs 4. I'm going to show you a principle. Look at Proverbs 4 and verse 18. In Proverbs 4 and verse 18, this is a beautiful principle, even about new light, because we are not locked into just merely the writings of our dear sister White and the writings of our various pioneers. There should be people of God that are writing more material, new material, and there's nothing wrong with new light. There's nothing wrong with it. All we got to do is guard against the new light canceling out the old light. Now, here's a biblical principle to show us how new light should work. It's in Proverbs 4 and verse 18. In Proverbs 4 and verse 18, here's what the Bible says. It says, but the path of the just is as what? The shining light that shineth more and more unto the 
perfect day. Now, what light do you think Solomon was learning this lesson from? What light do you think Solomon was talking about that is the way that the light comes about is the same way the path of the just progresses? What light do you think he was talking about? Sunlight, of course. Sunlight. Now, what do we learn about sunlight? At a certain time of the day, do you see a bit of light? Let's say it's 6 a.m., you know, 6.30, 7 a.m. Do we see a little bit of light? Yes. yes. And then by the time we get to 10 a.m., do we see more light? Yes. And then by the time we get to 12 p.m., do we see the height of daylight? Yes. yes, we do. So here's the idea. The path of the just is just like this shining light that God used as an object lesson. Now, what you don't see is you don't see dawn and a little bit of light, and then 10 a.m., more light, and then it suddenly gets dark again. And then at 12 p.m., light just pops up out of nowhere. That's not what you and I see. That is not the normal process. The light continues to progress and to grow, never canceling out the light beforehand, just making brighter and more beautiful the light that existed beforehand. That's how all new light should be as well. New light should function the same exact way. It should not cancel out the evident previous light that God has given to us through our pioneers, etc., our patriarchs and prophets, and so on. It should not cancel out their light. But there's nothing wrong if there's more light being brought to the front. What's one of the books of the Bible that you hardly ever hear a sermon from Song of Solomon. Um, again, some people, it's never. Some people, they're like, yeah, I can remember a sermon from like 10 years ago. Right? If I were to say, how many sermons have you heard from Matthew? Tons. How many from Mark, Luke, and John? Tons. How many from Daniel and Revelation? Tons. How many more from Isaiah and Ezekiel and so on? Many, many, many. Maybe Habakkuk is a little lacking. But honestly, how many sermons have you ever heard from Song of Solomon? Now, this is the one book of the Bible where God actually uses marriage relation language. And God, and God is so pure, but we're so impure that we don't know how to read it. And then we have the nerve to have conferences for the church where we talk about married couples and we start talking about if Song of Solomon is talked about, it's in a dirty, nasty, perverted way. Because that's how sick our minds are before we're converted. We don't know how to address this subject except from the world we come from. But in the mind of God, God had no problem. It was the Holy Ghost that made Solomon say some of the words. You ever looked at some of the words? And so, you, you, you'd be scared to say it in a church setting. You'd be scared to say it in a church. But it's in the Bible. It's in this open book we all study from. So what I'm saying is that the devil has done a number on us. Let's admit it, the devil has done a number on us. And that number is, is he's taken something very pure, very beautiful, and very lovely, very holy. Very holy. And we separated it from holiness. We separated it from God. And where did we get that from? We got that from our secular, carnal exposure and experiences and it needs to stop and so yeah man it's like our pioneers may not have wrote, written a lot about it our, 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 our prophet of the Lord may not have written a lot about it but if God touches your mind and touches my mind to say Lord we are living in the time of a crisis can I show you something go to Galatians 5 this is the only sin that you see named four times it's the only sin that you see named four times go ahead and turn there Galatians 5 let me see if I can pull this up real quick um, all right, one second. Oh, perfect. Oh, praise the Lord. Let me, let me, let me just pull this up for you real quick. Do, 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 do. Oh, boy. Let's see if I can find this thing. Christ is waiting, the angels, da, 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 a person's character. Fashion is the tyranny of the Yes. Faith. 
I'm just trying to find this for you very quickly. Ah, look at that. I created a slide on it. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you forget how much material you put together. Galatians 5, verse 19. Notice this. These are, list, these are the works of the flesh that are listed. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. Do you know that all four of those things mentioned all deal with sexual sin? There's no other sins or there's no other works of the flesh that's spoken of in a synonymous nature in the entire listing of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. In other words, it's like God knew that this is going to be an issue. And even in the days of Mrs. White, she said sensuality is the sin of the age. And that's in her day where everybody was wearing a bunch of hoop skirts which was not healthy, okay? But even in her day, she saw sensuality is the sin of the age. So what do you think the servant of the Lord would say now if she was awake? It's like we are living in a, 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 a society that is very sexually focused. It's very sensuality focused. The women in our church, many of them struggle to look good and look modern and still maintain modesty. Sometimes the sisters look a little out of date. <laughs> and it ought not be. Exodus 28. When, when Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, that he says, you are a royal priesthood, was he talking to just men or was he talking to men and women? He was talking to men and women. He was talking to the whole church, all right? So when Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, etc. Are women part of the royal priesthood? Yes. yes. So in a certain sense, God looks at us as priests, representatives of Christ to make his merits known to the world. When you go to Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 and 2, turn there, please. Exodus 28, 1 and 2. Ladies, I'm going to show you something about yourself, even though you didn't ask. Because you need to know. All right. So I want you to watch this. Exodus 28. And ladies, I assure you, the men get away with nothing. We have boatloads of issues. That's right. Exodus 28. Amen. Glad you got it. Look at what it says. Exodus 28, 1 and 2. Right? This is how all priests are supposed to dress. Exodus 28, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Verse 2, and thou shalt make what kind of garments? Holy, Holy garments for Aaron thy brother for what and what? For glory and for beauty. God says, I want your clothes to look beautiful. God has no problem with beauty. God has no problem with healthy fashion. Now, you work with what you got. You know what I'm saying? If you got one outfit, you wear that thing well. No, I'm serious. You work with what you have. You work with what you have. But this thing where sisters... <laughs> you, you, got, you got to take care of yourselves. Don't feel like I got them, so I don't need to pay attention anymore to how I look and stuff. You still got to fix your hair. You still got to dress nicely, etc. This is what you do. This is what God wants us to do. And the same rule for the brothers. It's like, nah, man, you got to look good for your wife. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with this. We start, to, oh, he's getting worldly because what, he cuts his beard or something like that? It's like, no, trimming and, and this is what we're supposed to do. Now, one second to you. Now, sisters, I'm letting you know right now you are a target. Period. End of story. You can hate it, but it's the truth, and it's not going anywhere. You are a target. You are Satan's target. If you study the Bible, women often ask, why me? Why is he always talking about, you know, or, or whatever? Or they say, well, we need, why don't you let the consecrated women talk about us? It's like, I'm still waiting for them. I know they exist, but I'm, I'm waiting for more sisters to step up to the plate to talk about these subjects. But Jesus talked about it, and he was a man, so I'm going to act like Jesus. I'm a man, and I'm going to talk about it. Why me? Ladies, 
pay attention to scripture. You got this story, you got this story, you got this story, you got this story, and you have this story. Now, in all of these stories in the Bible, it was the women that, get, that the devil used to lead the men into sin. In every single one of these stories, you go ahead and read it in your spare time. Just write the verses down, take a picture. If you study it, ladies, you're a target. I'm just telling you, you're a target. And if, you, if you're about to say, Dwayne Lemon just said a chauvinistic statement, how dare he? I cannot believe he said that women are a target. I don't like him anymore. I would say, wait, before you dislike me, you might have to dislike somebody else. Because this is what somebody else said. Satan chooses women, for he can use them more successfully than he can men. Ladies, you're a target. Sisters, you are a target. I'm just, I'm, I'm letting you know as your brother, y'all women are powerful because there's a king and there's a fool in every man. And the one you talk to is the one that will respond. If you learn to talk to the king in your man, you can help bring the king out of him. But if you keep talking to the fool in your man, you're going to pull the fool out of him. You got to understand that, sisters, God has given you an incredible power. Can you imagine David? That brother is angry. He is like, how dare Nabal tell me no? He don't know who I am? Well, he's about to find out. So he gets on his horse, and he's riding with his boys. He's like, we're going to take care of this. And the next thing you know, what happens? The Bible says Abigail comes along, and Abigail says, my husband is a fool. <laughs> You are the anointed of God. You are the one that's called. She's speaking to the king in him. She starts telling him all this stuff. David says, surely the Lord has spoken to you, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, I'm just telling the story as it is. David evidently was so impressed that he was like, you know what? I'm going to leave. And he left. But when Abigail came home and told Nabal what happened, and then Nabal was acting all arrogant, and Nabal falls back dead, Somehow the word got out, David, Abigail's single. <laughs> and David did not forget the impression that he, she had on his heart to the point that we know the rest of the story. And in what I'm saying, sisters, is that you have a lot of power. You have been given a lot of power. God wants it and Satan wants it. This is the reason, this is one of the foundational reasons for dress reform. This is one of the foundational reasons for, for this beautiful description of 1 Peter 3 about a woman being chaste. You know, you can't be too loud and brash and in people's faces like that. That's not representing chastity. That's almost a lost word in today's society amongst our women. But older women, Titus chapter 2, tells the older women that you're the ones that's supposed to teach the younger women how to function in godliness. And that's why there's always going to be a relevance to our older generation as well as the young generation. And so I'm just simply encouraging you to understand, ladies, you've been chosen. You have been chosen. And like I showed you in the story, all those scriptures show clear as day, women are a target of Satan. You have incredible influential power. And God can use you, sisters. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear to use your power for evil. Use it for good. Amen? Amen. Yes, my brother, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. I'm going to put this other slide back so if y'all want to see those verses again, then I can go ahead and put it up there. Go ahead, my brother. Uh, yeah, back to uh, Brother Shiraz's uh, statement in reference to, you know, what the founders uh, and those uh, earlier pioneers carved out. Um, I think this, you know, here again, opinion, so to speak. Sure, sure. Um, you know, we don't, I think God leaves some room for us to use some common sense and some okay. thoughts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Uriah Smith on the book he wrote, uh, there's some questions that we know, Daniel 11, and, and sometimes you say, well, do the person have all the answers on it or right. not, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so forth, Revelation. So, I think um, the church... Is I can't I think try to be careful not to become uh, a, a dictator so to speak to tell you every little something you shouldn't do this 
And Ellen White made this statement in dress perform, um, six inches, nine inches, whatever above the knee and so forth. So I, I would imagine some things may be left uh, if you really have an interest and want to study. I, I know you mentioned that, to look into it. Uh, if we follow that concept, even though you may not get a specific straight uh, thing, maybe the church don't say, or like you mentioned something the church <coughs> haven't uh, took, a, took a stand on, but if the person themselves, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, really took an interest and done their own kind of thoughts on it, they may come up with uh, correct. But I, I, then again, it's one thing for everybody, if you know what I mean. Then right, there are right. some things for everybody now. Right. You right. know what I mean? Like adulteries for everybody. You know what I mean? For yes, sir. Yes, so sir. So a certain thing for everybody. But then there's some other area you, um, you'll be good to, to, to pray together or husband, wife, or you individually, uh, whatever. And uh, I think that God will give you the right understanding some kind of way, you know. Amen. Amen. Very well stated, Brother Randall. I appreciate that. Thank you. Is there another question? Oh, okay. So we got my sister's hands right here. Where was that found? <clears throat> Satan chooses women for it. I just wanted to know what book Manuscript was that? release book 10. Okay. Manuscript. Page 76, paragraph 2. Satan chooses women because he can use them more effectively than he can men. Oh, my word. That's a deep statement. Yes. I remember today in sermon you stated that you know one of the last things that the Lord is waiting to see in us as His people is you know the love, His love yes. for His people. So what are some practical ways we can you know get this you know lifestyle initiated? Okay, in other words, learning how to really love people like Christ did, right? Um, there's a few things, and Paul helps us with this. You know, one of the things Paul was really good at is remembering where he came from. Paul was really good at that. When you read Galatians chapter 1, the Bible literally says, Paul says, I remember that I persecuted the church and killed the saints. You know, he remembered that. Did you know that God gave us an opportunity to remember where we came from every week? Amen. You know what it's called? The Sabbath. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look at what the Bible says. In Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, you will see that God literally told us how we should commemorate Sabbath. Now, it's not limited to commemorating creation. That's one of our blessings is to commemorate creation. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. That's why we go out into the scenes of nature, especially those of us who are parents with children. We take our little precious children out and we start to do all sorts of things and learn of God in nature. Now, let's take a look at Deuteronomy 5. Let's notice what it says in verse 15. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15, it says, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. Question, what did Egypt represent? It represented a house of bondage. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 20, verse 1, and then verse 2. Now, here's the thing. Egypt represents bondage. Well, what's the bondage that we deal with? You remember Jesus said in John chapter 8, it was in verse 31. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 31, he said, If you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed. Verse 32, he then says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In verse 33, they said, We be Abraham's seed, and have never been in bondage to any man. How sayest thou then that we shall be made free? Verse 34, Jesus says, Whosoever commits sin is the servant or bondman to sin. So literally, Egypt represents the house of bondage or us being bound by our sins. So let's go back to Deuteronomy 5.15. It says, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So part of Sabbath keeping is to commemorate, to remember that you were once in bondage, and God with a mighty hand delivered you. If we did this every Sabbath to just take time to remember and to thank him for the ways that he delivered us from the bondages of our lives, this is a way that we keep ourselves humble, okay? 
This is one of those ways in a very practical way is to keep ourselves humble. For what causes us to get so self-exalted is often forgetting from whence we came. So that's one thing that a person can do is to be intentional about remembering where you came from, remembering the previous experiences of your life, remembering the hand of God that has worked upon you. Number two is remember not only what God delivered you from, but what he's delivering you from. In other words, um, Carla Faye Tucker. How many of you ever seen my Carla Faye Tucker explanation? Wow, this is perfect. Okay. So let me show you this. I, I often like to talk about Carla Faye Tucker because this is uh, something good for us to remember. Carla Faye Tucker. All right, so here we go. Here it is. So this is Carla Faye Tucker. This is an image of Carla Faye Tucker. She, she was, um, <clears throat> Carla Faye Tucker's her name. She was born on November 18th, 1959. She died by execution February 3rd, 1998. This was in Texas. So what ended up happening? <clears throat> Carla and a friend decided to rob someone's house. And when Carla went to rob someone's house, they went inside the house and spoiled their goods and started to take their stuff. Well, what ended up happening is Carla went into the bedroom and she saw like a bodily figure that she was saying, there's something under these sheets. There was someone hiding under the sheet. She ended up pulling the sheet out and it was a woman by the name of Debbie Thornton. Debbie Thornton was committing adultery with the man of that house. In other words, she should have never been there. Well, Carla began to wrestle her to the ground. And as they were fighting, Carla saw a pickaxe. So she grabs the pickaxe, and she takes the pickaxe, and she starts hitting Debbie Thornton with it. She eventually takes the pickaxe and embeds it in Debbie Thornton's heart and kills her. Now, Carla gets caught. When Carla got caught, uh, she was being interviewed. Now, I have to speak in code. When they asked Carla what was going through her mind when she killed this woman, this was Carla's response. Carla said, I had, oh, let me just put it up here. Now, oh, well, let me, let me put it this way. There's an experience that's designated only for husbands and wives. Are you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Then, watch this. There is a height in that experience that begins with the letter O. Are you still following me? Okay. This is what Carla said. Tucker proceeded to hit Thornton repeatedly with the pickaxe and then embedded the axe in her heart. This is what she said next. Tucker would later tell people and testify that she experienced intense multiple O's with every blow of the pickaxe. This is a true story. So I remember reading this, and I remember thinking to myself, these were the words that came out of my mouth. I said, that's sick. Those were the first two words that just came out of my mouth after reading that this woman has the audacity that every blow she's having intense multiple O's. I said, that's sick. Now, I am one to believe. I don't know what you all believe on this, but I am one to believe that God speaks to us. Isaiah 668 says the Lord speaks even his mysteries to us personally. So God speaks to us personally. So here's what happened. I'm pacing. I'm a pacer. And so I'm pacing, and I'm just like, that is so sick. I can't believe that somebody would do that. That's crazy. And as I'm saying that in my mind, the Lord began to speak to my heart. Yeah, Dwayne. That's really sick for someone to experience so much pleasure while killing another innocent person. And I'm like, yes. I said, who would do that? Some, that person's out of their mind. That person's next level crazy. And God was like, yep, I agree. A person must really be out of their mind to experience so much pleasure while killing an innocent person. And it's like I'm not getting it yet. And so God starts pressing this thing on my heart a little harder. Yes, Dwayne, how disgusting, how terrible it is for someone not to just commit murder, 
but to experience so much intense pleasure while murdering an innocent person. And that's when I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And because I filled my mind with so much scripture, Hebrews 6.6 6 came back to my head that every time we indulge in sin, we crucify the Son of God afresh and bring him to an open shame. And God was trying to say, yes, Dwayne, it's very sick, not merely that one would kill an innocent person, but have so much pleasure while doing it. And then God said, Dwayne, you are Carla Faye Tucker. And that was very hard for me to accept. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not as bad as her. God was like, you're right, you're worse. Because she only did it once. How many times did you kill my son afresh? When you knew it was wrong. She's a murderer. You are a serial killer. And so the more that this thing really started to sink in my mind, I said, God have mercy on me. This is our greatest challenge when it comes to us loving the unlovable. Something told us that they're more guilty than us. Something keeps telling us that. We, 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 I have fundamental scriptures, brothers and sisters, that you all know and understand. Think about it. You know this. What is sin, according to the Bible? Transgression of the law, right? Okay, watch this. How many of the commandments do I need to break in order to be guilty? Okay, good intelligent class. Now watch this, you, you intelligent group of people. Watch this. The Bible says in James 2 that when we break one, we are guilty of breaking how much? Oh. So why is it that when you tell a lie, you don't see yourself as a murderer? Are you following, family? Isaiah 1 6? Putrefying. Oh, we yeah. We really stink. Oh. We're disgusting. We sing. Uh, thank you. These are, these are hard verses for us to accept, Sister Amy. Yeah. It's liberating. Yeah. I, I think it's liberating. Because guess what? As long as you keep justifying yourself, you're not ready to receive God's justification. Go to Romans 4. I just want to show this to you real quick. Romans 4. Let's look at who gets justification, right? If you carefully look at the Bible, who gets justified? It's so clear. These verses were always in our face. Just somehow, I think we just missed it. In Romans 4, look at verse 5. I'm going to ask you, how do we get justified? Watch. Or who gets justified? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Okay. Is, justify, is justifying in the verse? What is it that must precede being justified in the verse? Say again. We got to believe. It's more than that. What else? The verse said it. Read it slow. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the... Who does God justify? The un That's the only people God justifies, are ungodly people. But if you keep denying that you're ungodly, then you don't need God's justification. You must accept that you're an ungodly undone person. And it's when you're convinced of that, okay, it's when you're convinced of that, God says, now I can justify you. But as long as we don't see it, we can never receive it. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you the clothes because I, I was told I got to stop. That's also Carla Faye Tucker. Oh. Carla found Jesus. Somebody came to Carla, they started to minister to her. Carla realized that I am ungodly, I am undone, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And she accepted Christ. She didn't just accept Christ, don't take a picture yet, I'm putting more up. She didn't accept, she did not only 
She not only accepted Christ, she became a minister in the prison. She began to lead people to Jesus. She began to preach in the prison. Many people turned their hearts to Christ to the point that when her execution date was coming, George W. Bush was appealed to by, among those who appealed to the state of Texas on her behalf were Backer Wally Nadaye, the United Nations Commissioner on Summer, Summary and Arbitrary Executions, the World Council of Churches, Pope John Paul II, Italian Prime Minister Romano Prodi, the Speaker of the House of uh, U.S. House of Representatives Newt Gingrich, televangelist Pat Robertson, and Ronald Carlson, the brother of Tucker's murder victim Debbie Thornton. They all said, "Please spare her life. She is a different person." George W. Bush ignored the appeals. And he executed her, nevertheless, on February 3rd. But like a friend of mine who I met personally, who wrote a book called I Will Die Free, Noble Alexander, she died free. She died free. And so the good news is, is if we're going to be Carla Faye Tucker, let's be Carla Faye Tucker. Are you following that, family? Amen. All right. Well, we have reached the end of our Q&A session. I think y'all got to eat or something like that. So let's go ahead and let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to close out our question and answer session. I enjoyed our time together. And I pray that someday soon we can do it again. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have supplied the answers to our questions. Lord, I pray that you might continue to bless us and give us your grace, Lord, to help us to study to show ourselves approved unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we should be back here at 7. Yes. <laughs> for the final. All right. His we'll testimony. See you all. We'll see you all in just a bit. <laughs>